Friday marks the second anniversary of the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico and what ended up being one of the largest ecological disasters in U.S. history. As America ramps up its oil production, we ask if there have been any improvements to safety regulations. You're watching Inside Story Americas from Washington. Hello, I'm Shihab Rutansi. On April the 20th, 2010, the Deepwater Horizon oil drilling rig in the Gulf of Mexico exploded, killing 11 workers. Oil flowed unabated for three months, spilling a total of 4.9 million barrels of it into the ocean. In January of 2011, a White House oil spill commission released its final report on the causes of the disaster. They blamed BP and its partners for making a series of cost-cutting decisions and the lack of a system to ensure drill well safety. It made a number of recommendations to improve safety and oversight. Now, members of that same presidential panel that investigated the rig explosion and spill are criticizing Congress for refusing to act on any of its recommendations, accusing it of being hostile to new regulation. On Wednesday, BP reached a settlement to resolve economic, property and medical claims but the company could still face potential claims from the federal and state governments. Two years on, there's even more drilling in the U.S. In fact, if forecasts are to be believed, oil production will be ramped up over the next few decades. President Obama boasts of the increased production on his watch, and the presumptive Republican presidential nominee, Mitt Romney, calls for even more drilling. Let's hear what they both have to say on the subject. Under my administration, America is producing more oil today than at any time in the last eight years. Over the, that's important to note. Over the last three years, I've directed my administration to open up millions of acres for gas and oil exploration across 23 different states. We're opening up more than 75 percent of our potential oil resources offshore. We've quadrupled the number of operating rigs to a record high. We've added enough new oil and gas pipeline to encircle the earth and then some. So we are drilling all over the place. Oh, I can cut through the, the, the baloney in the task force and just tell them, Mr. President, open up drilling in the Gulf, open up drilling in Anwar, open up drilling in the Outer Continental Shelf, drill in North Dakota, drill in, in Oklahoma and Texas. Let's start getting our uh, oil resources. And by the way, let's also start opening up our natural gas resources instead of having it held up by the EPA. So that can ultimately become a, a transportation fuel. <music> So should we rely on oil companies to regulate their own safety standards or should the government introduce new legislation to minimize the possibility of another environmental catastrophe? Joining us to discuss this are Robin Milliken, the policy director of the Institute for Energy Research and a former Senate energy advisor. In New York, we have Greg Pallast, an investigative reporter and author on the petroleum industry. And Michael Craig is a campaign energy analyst at Oceana, a group which works to protect the world's oceans. Greg Pallas, first of all, then two years on from Deepwater Horizon, what have we learned, do you think? Not much. I think one of the problems is that we are letting BP and the oil industry continue to regulate itself. I was conducting an investigation which I've just released in which we found out that BP with uh, Chevron and Exxon and the Bush administration covered up a prior blowout almost identical to the deep water blowout, which occurred two years before the Gulf explosion. They covered that up. That type of lack of reporting, that type of concealment of dangers is serious business. Uh, what happened there was quick dry cement failed. Why are we still using these cheap methods in the Gulf? Why aren't we regulating these things in a tougher manner so that there won't be another deep water horizon? Greg, we'll it's, get onto those specifics. Uh, it's, it's a big problem. We'll get onto those specifics in a moment, then. But uh, Robin Milliken, uh, as far as the charges of the members of that presidential commission are concerned, um, none of their recommendations have gone through Congress. 150 deep water safety bills were introduced to Congress. None of them were passed. Why is there such congressional reluctance? Do you think then to impose more regulation on this industry? 
Sure. Well, I think it's clear uh, that the Oil Spill Commission that made those recommendations had an agenda from the beginning that was namely to prevent the production of energy here in the United States. They namely wanted to expand it to the Arctic and also implement a national oceans policy, which would have placed vast new restrictions on what we can do in our federal water. So I think that Congress recognizes that there are politically tinged elements of that report. And also there were numerous congressional reports that came out that showed that the administration had mishandled its, uh, its response to the oil spill. So I don't think it's surprising at all that Congress is reluctant. Uh, Michael Craig, would you accept that then, that, that there was some sort of agenda in that report, that these, these calls for closer scrutiny and regulation are simply trying to, um, to kill the energy industry in some ways? I don't think so. I think they recognize that offshore drilling is an inherently risky practice and that it has a lot of dangers. We saw in the BP spill, we've seen a lot of spills around the world in the past couple months, all of these large spills. So I think they recognize that offshore drilling is a risky business. There are a lot of dangers to it. It's a very complex undertaking and that we need strong regulations, strong safety, strong oversight to make sure that spills like the BP spill or the small spills that happen every day don't happen. Let's just remind us of, of some of the conclusions of that report. Again, in, in January of 2011, the White House appointed a national commission into the oil disaster. Uh, it released its final report, and, and amongst those uh, conclusions were the Deepwater Horizon disaster was foreseeable and preventable, errors and misjudgments by three major oil drilling companies, BP, Halliburton, and Transocean, played key roles in the disaster. Government regulation was ineffective and failed to keep pace with technology advancements in offshore drilling. Let's go through some of those then in a bit more detail now. Um, Greg Pallas, first of all then, as far as the, the cause of the Deepwater Horizon, the, the shortcuts and the cost cutting that even, you know, proponents, uh, even oil lobbyists have come on saying, okay, there were definitely some problems there. Uh, have those been sorted out? Will that happen again, do you think? No, they haven't been sorted out. And that's the problem. Right now, there's a drill baby drill mentality in the U.S. Congress and even in the Obama administration, which makes anyone reluctant to impose any type of control that somehow if we don't drill everywhere without any control, the price of gasoline will fall at the pump. We have particular problems. For example, in places like Brazil, you don't see them using shortcut penny-pinching methods like using nitrogen-laced quick-dry cement. Right now, we have Halliburton and BP pointing the finger at each other over the use of the cement. The answer is, don't use these cheap methods at all. Uh, and we need some regulation because obviously these guys are pointing the finger at each other rather than taking responsibility together to stop this dangerous, risky way of operating. Michael Craig. And that's just one example. Well, yeah, so another, another major issue in this disaster was the failure of the blowout preventer, which is supposed to seal the, the oil uh, in the uh, wellhead and, and prevent it from, um, from seeping out. I mean, have we now, and of course that failed. Mm -hmm. um, are we confident now in blow, blowout, uh, blowout preventer technology that that's now advanced and we're, and we're safe now? We're not, no. So this is, you know, this has been a topic of a lot of debate. Um, there were new regulations put into place that, you know, change the testing of blowout preventers and the maintenance of blowout preventers. But when you look back at the BP spill, BP's blowout preventer was tested before it failed and it passed those tests. And so clearly those tests aren't enough. And the reason is because these blowout preventers have underlying design flaws. There were a number of reports that came out, um, all of which were focused on looking at the blowout preventer itself and asking why this failed because people, it was unexpected. People didn't think it would fail, but it did. And they found that there were design flaws in it that were that could be, uh, that could exist in all the other blowout preventers in the offshore drilling fleet. So, so th those are two major issues, and as far as the cause of the, uh, the, the horizon disaster are concerned. Robin, I mean, why, it, to ask for more regulation and oversight over cement or blowout preventers, is that necessarily therefore attempting to have an agenda against the energy companies? Isn't it just simply trying to make them more efficient, perhaps even help them a bit? Sure. Well, I think that the point here is, was the regulation warranted? in light of the fact that there were no incidents for 60 years, virtually no incidents that would have, would have necessitated making the regulatory environment more stringent than it was. The BP incident was a tragedy, but the administration used a crisis to essentially step in and impose a regulatory regime that they had already envisioned at the, at but the onset. But even have they? I mean, hasn't, I mean, they haven't really imposed Well, I think if you look money. at the fact that we're at a nine-year low for fossil fuels production. 
the amount of land that's currently leased on the Outer Continental Shelf, which contains 86 billion barrels of oil, is 3 percent. And while, the, while Greg contends that the administration has a drill baby drill mentality, I think that that is starkly different than what the reality is. That does not reflect the well, administration's like anti-energy uh, policies that, that, like I said, we're at a 11, the production amount that we're at right now for oil is 11 percent less than the previous Greg year. Greg Powell? Yeah, uh, let me correct the facts, though. You just said that there's been drilling safely for 60 years. That's absolutely not true. In fact, that was the testimony of BP and Chevron and Exxon six months before the Deepwater Horizon blowout, which was one year after a blowout in the Caspian Sea, just as disastrous as the Deepwater Horizon, and they concealed it. They covered it up. It's not true. These guys have had lots of terrible accidents, which have been covered up. We need to know about them. Frankly, we have no record of trusting this industry. When you hear well, lines Greg, like 60 years of safe drilling, it's not true. The, what 2008, we're discussing, September, massive blowout covered up. What we're discussing is what the United States regulatory regime looks like in regard to drilling. And okay, well, well, let's look at that specifically then, Michael. I mean, is there now sufficient oversight? Has, has the Obama administration now instituted necessary oversight? We don't think to, so. To make sure the BP can't get away with secrets. Blows. Right, right. We don't think so. And we, you know, the National Commission just issued their report card on Tuesday. Oceana also re issued a report card of our own where we looked at the changes that have been put into place since the BP spill two years ago and asked if they've changed anything. And, you know, in many of these areas, there just hasn't been any action. As you said, Congress has not passed a single bill that would increase offshore drilling safety. And that hasn't happened. And even where we have these categories where actions have taken place, like new regulations, there are lots of problems within those actions. And so people can say, yeah, well, we're trying to fix this. But the reality is they haven't been fixed, and yet drilling is going on. Okay. Well, and well, that's let, a problem. we'll look into some of the reasons then why, 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 in your view, there might have been this inaction. But just one other specific issue sure. the, the commission brought up, the ability to deal with a spill if it happens. Sure. Has there been any development in that technology, in, in those uh, precautionary measures to make sure that, you know, that, that an oil well won't spew oil for days and days and days on end? Right, right. So there are really two components to this. One is well containment. So that means when you have a blowout, you have a cap, you put the cap on the well and it seals the well. In this area, um, the industry has tried to improve it. They've established two consortiums and, you know, they're very proud of the containment cats they've developed. But a recent Government Accountability Office report um, looked at how these containment caps were being analyzed by the government and they found that there was limited assurance that operators would be able to contain a subsea blowout. In other words, that there were no standards that the Department of the Interior is using right now and so our assurance as citizens that these con containment caps will actually work you know, we don't have. So, any Robin, assurance. I mean, to ask again for, for more precautionary measures. I mean, is that simply missing the point? We we, we should just be reassured by the fact that, uh, well, at least officially, theoretically, these blowouts don't happen very often. So we don't need to take across the board precautionary measures in all the uh, amongst uh, in all the oil uh, wells that are drilling quite nicely, at least for the moment. I mean, uh, what? well, look, we are absolutely for having smart regulations that balance uh, energy security, economic uh, considerations and environmental protection. We don't dispute that at all. However, the, the fact of the matter is that this was an incident that did not warrant a blanket moratorium that resulted in we are now producing a quarter of a million barrels less per day from the Gulf, which is equivalent to the consumption of the states of Nevada and New Mexico. I don't think that that that's warranted, especially in a time where we have disruptions in the Middle East, in Libya, with the EU restrictions on oil that would be yeah, but imported I mean, from that, Iran. That underlying that, then, is a sense that the, that the U.S. is using the oil that's, that is being uh, extracted from its own geographical boundaries. But that's not simply true. It just goes into the global market. I mean, it doesn't necessarily affect our ability to buy more oil, does it? I mean, or... It, at a cheaper rate. Right? It does provide the United States with more leverage, certainly it does. And 80 percent of the resource potential lies in deep water areas, which these restrictions namely applied to. But I, I do want to go back to the issue, though, of why, why we don't trust the recommendations of the oil spill report. Uh, there, there's recently come to light, uh, well, not recently, this was a problem originally, but uh, the, the House Natural Resources Committee, I believe, is the one that issued a subpoena that 
request documents from the administ administration relating to their misrepresentation of the views of experts that they quoted in the report. They said these ex experts, based on their opinions, a six-month moratorium is justified, and the experts themselves came back and said there is no there is no justification for imposing a blanket moratorium. So on keep, keep on drilling, even though the fundamental issues that led to the Deepwater Horizon uh, rig exploding haven't been sorted out, and the fundamental issues that led to it being able to spew oil into the Gulf for days on end uh, haven't been addressed either. And that and that um, investigation is about the moratorium itself. And so the National Commission's report, you know, came out after, and it was. It was completely separate from the moratorium, and you know it's also not fully the government's problem that we're not producing enough because the oil and gas companies are sitting on 4,000 leases that they own in the Gulf of Mexico that they aren't developing at all. So, but right that doesn't now, mean those are the greatest resource potential areas. No, but it I'm, could be that they buy them just for covering their assets. Sure, basically. sure, right. But I mean, they have Let these me, resources uh, that they can exploit. Greg Palast, sorry. Yeah, first of all, I haven't heard any objection to a particular safety requirement or safety recommendation of the panel, just that they're evil people who don't want us to have oil. Uh, some of the recommendations are obvious. In fact, they were recommended 21 years ago when I was working on the Exxon Valdez investigation. There, British Petroleum, not Exxon, was in charge of containing the spill from the Exxon Valdez. They didn't have the equipment there. They weren't prepared for it. 21 years later, BP has a blowout. They didn't have the equipment there. They weren't prepared for it. Same company, Exxon Valdez, Deepwater Horizon, both are BP, by the way. And in those cases, they weren't prepared. I think we have to have a law that says you'd better be prepared and have a spill response system. One of the reasons to have a moratorium for a while, in fact, is that we had no equipment left in case there was another blowout. So. There was a reason for a moratorium to find out what went wrong. We had no equipment in case of a spill. And by the way, today we're still short of equipment in case of a spill. And These companies have to be responsible in case there's a spill to contain the oil from spreading all over the Gulf or Alaska or California or Florida. And that's a great point because, that, as you said, it didn't change between Valdez and the BP spill, and it hasn't changed now two years later. And so, But I suppose underlying this entire issue is that, that sort of philosophical framework of whether regulation is needed or whether market forces uh, and deregulation. I mean, it's in these companies' self-interest to, to run a tight ship, I suppose, is, is the thought. But is that what's underlying things, then, that philosophy? Uh, Michael Craig, when Mitt Romney says, look, you know, he calls the commission baloney, he says, in fact, he wants to further deregulate, deregulate the, the oil industry. It's because there's this true belief, though, that market forces have to work. The oil industry has to know that they have to uh, be, be safe, otherwise they won't still be in, in business. Or are they simply just, or, or, or doesn't Mitt Romney care about safety? I mean, it has to be some philosophical thing, unless it's, unless it's purely just, you know, corporate cash for his campaign. Though. Right, and I think a big part of that is accountability and being able to detect when companies are cutting corners. So when they cut corners, you know, sometimes you have a spill like the BP spill, and that puts BP $32 billion in the hole. But a lot of the times, we're not catching these corners that are being cut, and they, you know, they pass off, it, it goes okay, but in the end, you have a spill like the BP spill occurring. And so being able to hold those companies accountable and being able to catch those is a big part of what we need to address, and but, we haven't done it. But Greg Palace, I mean, when you hear p p politicians like Mitt Romney say, you know, these commissions are baloney, let's deregulate, do you, do you believe in their sincerity, that, in, their, in their sincere belief in market forces being enough regulation, or, or do you think there's something else at work? Well, as a fraud and racketeering investigator, the bad news is I read one memo after another from inside BP's Alyeska operation, from inside Exxon, inside Chevron, inside BP, in which they are covering up one accident, one failure, taking shortcuts to save money. And it's not pennies. When you don't have an oil spill response system, that can save billions a year for the industry. Uh, using quick dry cement might be hundreds of millions of dollars a year for the industry. They're cutting corners all the time, and I'm not even sure that the amount that BP has paid is any type of ultimate pain compared to the savings of going on the cheap when they drill. And that's one of the problems. They don't come clean about their operations. If it comes down between money and safety, Money wins, and that's how the market works. You know, I was a student of Milton Friedman, and believe me, he'll tell you, the market goes for the money. Profits first, bottom line. Robin Milliken, can, can you understand can you, the, the skepticism then of, of, of a market-based system of regulation? I actually disagree. Uh, I think that, 
Well, if, if you look at the laws that are on the books right now, the Oil Pollution Act, which was implemented in the 1990s, makes it so that per barrel of oil spilled, industry is liable for $1,200. That adds up really quickly. So it, industry has a tremendous incentive to go, go into operations with ensuring standards that, that immunize them to the problem of liabilities. BP actually, in a lot of ways, got a really good deal with the $20 billion settlement because the, the whole host of liabilities that they would have opened up, been, up, been opened up to otherwise is tremendous. So I, I disagree that companies have an incentive to go into the Gulf and act cavalier. And that's not the only law that applies to... They have short-term shareholder other. incentives, and it does seem to appear that any, um, any punitive action, if, if any is finally even instituted, uh, takes decades to, to, to sort out. So doesn't that, isn't that one of the problems there? I mean, they, they do seem to... Exxon, for example, I mean, and, and the Valdez, I mean, it took, what, 20 years or something for, for, a, for a rather paltry payment to yes. be paid out? And, and still, this, the issue of culpability doesn't ever seem to be addressed. I mean, isn't it shareholder value over long-term, perhaps, punitive action? I mean, isn't that the problem? Well, I can't speak to the workings of the judicial system. I think it entirely depends on the circumstances. But BP, in this case, although they do have the settlement deal, mm. are still open to federal uh, enforcement action against them, and that will come swiftly. You so know, I, I, I disagree that there is. On Wednesday, we were looking um, at the BP oil spill and the, and the lingering effects of, of the Deepwater Horizon. And we were speaking to one of, one of the panelists, was a, a gentleman named Jay Bennett Johnson. He's the former chairman of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. He's now an oil industry lobbyist, which is a whole different story, I suppose. But he, he seemed to. Um, he seemed to acknowledge that there were problems in the activities of BP he see, he, and the potential harm for the environment and for public health, but he seemed to suggest there was no choice because we need oil so much. This is how the, the exchange occurred on uh, Tuesday's Inside Story. The oil industry, look, is the first to be concerned about uh, damage to the Gulf because they're the ones who are going to have to pay for it. What is your no answer to stop, stop using uh, petroleum? So is that it then? So basically the, the economic usage, the need for oil has to trump public safety and environmental concerns in the end, we have no choice? Well, what is your choice? And in fact, that was Wednesday's inside story. And that, that man was the watchdog. And, and he seemed to therefore be suggesting, look, I mean, the fact is we're just too reliant on oil. Um, there may be problems, but we have no choice but to keep on drill baby uh, drilling. What's your response, Michael Craig? I think that's, you know, a really wrong approach to take. So when we're issuing permits now, those permits aren't going to be developed for 10 years. And as I said, oil and gas companies are sitting on oil. And what we need to do now, instead of issuing permits, is to start using alternative energies, is to start increasing fuel efficiency standards like have been put into place. Those put a sizable dent in how much oil we consume. The most recent round from 2016 to 2025 would increase fuel efficiency and save about 0.8 million barrels per day, which is about a 20th of how much we consume. And so that is a ton of oil right there saved through one policy. We have hybrid electric vehicles. We have full electric vehicles. We have biofuels. We use oil and electricity generation when natural gas or renewables can do it just as well and much more cleanly, much cheaper. So we have all these areas where we can cut oil consumption, and so it's not true but, that we just uh, need Robert, to Robert, I mean, for that's, that's one of the, the members of the commission are now saying, actually, that delays in taking the sort of steps that they're, they're advocating might, might, might harm energy security. It's, it's not going to lead to an energy secure America if you rely on unsafe technologies with enormous potential consequences to health and the, and the environment. That actually might cause a disruption to the oil supply if there is another accident. And actually, uh, and also it, it weds us to the, the, the fossil fuel, the global fossil fuel market of which the U.S. has no control over anyway. It's actually leading to energy insecurity. Well, like I said, I don't, there, there's no evidence that this is a, a pattern. So I, I disagree with the validity of saying that BP, things on the level of the Macondo incident are warrant our, our switching because oil Oil is an abundant resource in the United States. We have enough oil, according to government estimates, the, U the U.S. Energy Information Administration says uh, that we have uh, enough for two. And we're running out of time years. now. So, but, but Greg, pass very quickly. I mean, isn't that the point then? It was easier for President Obama and others to talk about green technology uh, before new extractive technology made this abundance of oil uh, suddenly reappear in the U.S. I mean, it, it's not. There's not going to be any change, is there necessarily? There's an awful lot of oil right now in the U.S., and we don't have to, therefore, settle for the most unsafe, risky methods in which the costs are borne by the public. Yeah, but, but isn't, isn't there any reason why there is so much oil in the U.S. because of those risky extractive technologies, though? Isn't that the problem? 
Well, it, not, it doesn't have to be risky. You know, that, that's the problem is that the industry wants to cut corners and do everything on the cheap. If you want to, if you want to operate on the cheap, it's risky. All right, Greg it, Palast. It's inherently dangerous. Thank you very much. Greg Palast, Robin Millikan, and Michael Craig. Thank you very much. That's all from the Washington, D.C. TV.